tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. No mai, hara mai, welcome to this first presentation for the University of Auckland Early Childhood Seminar Series in 2024. We'll begin our time together with karakia. Me enoi tātou. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa tōnamu te moana, te huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i a tātou katoa. Haumie, huie, taekie. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation by Louise Gorst and Alice Chia, who are both PhD student candidates at the University of Auckland. Alice and Louise are both researching leadership in early childhood settings, each using different methodologies and with different research foci. We know that the ideas that they will share today will be of interest to our early childhood seminar series audience, and we're delighted to have them both with us today to share their elements of their current research. If any questions arise for you during the presentation that you would like to ask the presenters, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and they'll respond to them at the end of their presentation. You can also use the chat function throughout the presentation to connect with each other and the panellists. After the seminar, a recording will be available on our Early Childhood Seminar Series YouTube channel. I will now pass over to Hel Professor Helen Hedges to welcome and introduce Louise Gorst and Alice Chia. Thanks, Helen. Hello, Justine. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Teaching practice, ongoing professional learning, and teacher leadership are intertwined concepts in the everyday work experiences and identities of early childhood teachers. How might we think about these concepts separately and together to enrich our understandings and ensure curriculum and pedagogy serve the interests and needs of children, families, and whānau. To consider these concepts and questions today, I'm delighted to welcome our seminar speakers, Alice and Louise. Both had their first experiences with early childhood education as student teachers, followed by a period of teaching practice. As each assumed leadership roles they were unsure if they were qualified or suitable for, both began to consider what it means to be a high quality teacher and an effective leader. What were the benefits and drawbacks of both roles? What were their connections and what kinds of personal and professional knowledge could legitimately be brought to the everyday practices of teaching and leading? Louise and Alice have both been involved in teacher education recently, bringing real-world knowledge and examples of practices and dilemmas to share with student and practicing teachers. Both are now clearly pursuing their PhD studies, so are models themselves of ongoing professional learning. Alice's master's and PhD studies focus on teacher leadership. In her doctoral work, she is exploring connections between teaching practice, professional learning and leadership. As well as being a fully certificated early childhood teacher in New Zealand, she's a certified interpreter in China, translating between English and Mandarin. Louise's master's and PhD studies also focus on teacher leadership. Her current research explores teachers' influence and leadership of curriculum and pedagogy. Such research requires to get her up close and personal with teacher practice and thinking, as you will hear shortly. Louise is a fully certificated and experienced early childhood teacher, leader, and mentor. As Justine has indicated, please use the Q&A function to pose questions that arise during what I'm sure is going to be a really interesting presentation. No my, haere my, Alice and Louise, we're delighted to have you with us today. Over to you, Alice. Thank you very much, Helen, for the warm introduction. We really appreciate the opportunity to present our studies in progress this evening here. Kila Koto, we honored to begin the webinar by discussing teacher leadership and its potential distinction from teaching. I will then draw on some examples from my early interviews of my current PhD research. I'm still pathway through my fieldwork, so I will follow up on these early data as my study proceeds. 
teacher leadership, a concept originating from the school sector, has attracted worldwide attention from scholars for its potential to improve the educational quality. There is no unified or fixed definition of teacher leadership. This indicates that different people may have different understandings of teacher leadership. It also leaves room for discussion, possibilities, and application to the ECE sector that is context appropriate. From the schooling sector, scholars like Yok Ba and Duke, Werner and Campbell have proposed diverse definitions of teacher leadership. You may have a look. from the definitions that teacher leadership as a process of influence is not limited to one individual who has a designated title but can involve all teachers with or without designated titles. Teacher leadership, therefore, focus more on practice rather than who is the leader. Hence, every teacher has the potential to be teacher leaders, influencing others within and beyond the classroom to improve the educational quality. Similarly, teacher leadership as a form of influence that all teachers can practice has been applied to the context of ECE. For example, Cooper theorized the leadership in New Zealand ECE as everyday collective leadership. The whole teaching team, including teachers with and without designated leadership roles, are involved in activities such as the whole team goal-directed inquiry and relational dialogues to improve the, the quality of education and care. Kakias et al.'s definition of teacher leadership in ECE corroborates Cooper's definition. They refer teacher leadership as intentional work for common desired goals, which seems to be a multi-dimensional and contextual phenomenon based on collaboration and leadership. Different definitions present the complexity of teacher leadership. This complexity might create difficulties for teachers to understand leadership and then inhibit them from recognizing themselves as leaders and fulfilling leadership expectations. However, it is the open view of teacher leadership that encourages teachers to enact leadership in multiple ways to suit their own ECE settings. Meanwhile, the open view of teacher leadership empowers teachers to constantly learn, discuss, and reflect on its meaning and the practice. Therefore, teacher leadership is not a static but dynamic concept. After highlighting the broad understanding of teacher leadership, now let's move on to teaching. Teaching involves appropriate interaction with learners using a number of strategies such as play, hands-on experience to enable learning to take place. In Tifaliki, Kayako's primary responsibility is to facilitate children's learning and development through thoughtful and intentional pedagogy. In our code, our standards, a total of six standards have been provided to describe what high quality teaching looks like in New Zealand. For example, teachers need to teach and respond to learners in a knowledgeable and adaptive way to progress their learning at an appropriate depth and pace, and use inquiry, collaborative problem solving, and professional learning to improve professional capability to impact on the learning and achievement of all learners. Based on the definitions, teacher leadership that's not equipped with good teaching, they are connected 
as being a great teacher is fundamental to becoming a teacher leader. But teacher leadership involves broader responsibilities and skills than teaching. For beginning teachers, developing teacher leadership can support their professional growth by improving teaching practices, attending to their own professional learning, and strengthening interaction with colleagues. In general, regarding the scope of input, teachers use a variety of teaching strategies to influence children, colleagues, and the families to support children's learning. While teacher leaders have a broader influence on colleagues within the team across the setting and community. In terms of the curriculum, teachers mainly implement or design the curriculum, but teacher leaders shape, design, or expand the curriculum to align with the center visions and goals. In terms of the support for learning, teachers focus on their own learning, while teacher leaders support their own and other teachers' learning through professional learning and development, providing professional feedback, sharing knowledge, and mentoring each other. Next, I will introduce my current research and provide examples from my early interviews. My research is a qualitative and interpretative case study aimed to explore provisionally certificated teachers' leadership experiences in their first two years of teaching in ECE in New Zealand. According to the Teaching Council of Aotearoa, New Zealand, provisionally certificated teachers refer to qualified teachers who hold provisional practicing certificates and they are required to take an induction and mentoring program that usually takes two years for a full practicing certificate. There are several ways to become a PCT in New Zealand ECE. In my study, ECTs refer to those New Zealand educated and ECE qualified teachers who have provisional practicing certificates and enter the ECE teaching profession without having full-time work experience in ECE settings. On the policy level, all registered teachers, including PCTs, are expected to show leadership as part of their everyday practice. In practice, PCTs have been found to take up leadership roles and responsibilities this may be due to PCT's qualified status, employer's expectations, the high teacher turnover, and the severe qualified teacher shortage in the ECE sector. The overarching research question of my study is, how might PCTs develop and enact teacher leadership in their first two years of teaching in ECE setting in New Zealand? I need my research question. I purposefully selected three ECE settings. One privately owned early learning center, one corporate owned early learning center, one kindergarten. I have now recruited one privately owned early learning center and one corporate owned early learning center. In each setting, a participant group includes one PCT, one teaching colleague, who works closely with the PCT and one positional leader. Multiple research methods have been adopted. This includes semi-structured individual interviews with PCTs and positional leaders, observations, focus group with PCT and their colleagues, and document analysis. Next, I would like to present some examples from early interviews and I will be following up on this data as my study progresses. Vicky is from the corporate owned early learning center. She is at the beginning of the second year of being a PCT after attaining her qualification 
of graduate diploma in teaching in the city. She is now working in the preschool role. From her perspective, leadership is guidance. She said, I think good leadership, quality of leadership, can make the team that works effectively any order. A good quality of leadership is concerning about everyone in your team and empowering them and trusting your team. So the trust and empowerment, they relate it to each other and also supporting each other. And the main thing is, no matter whether you are a head teacher or center manager, you need to put yourself in an equal place as others to work collaboratively. In Vicky's eyes, Leadership involves many responsibilities, such as guiding, supporting, and caring for each other. Her understanding of leadership emphasizes teacher leadership more in its influence on quality. When do you ask, in what ways do you see yourself as a leader? With the responding. Head teacher shares the question with me, but I have to take some responsibility for her. Like when the head teacher prepared some activities with children, like Father's Day, she was very happy. During that time, we had a new teacher, Robert. So I supported Robert to get familiar with our routine, children's routine, like all the different job contents, how to do clothes to do open in the morning and everything I explained to him. And I also showed him how to change children's napping and he tips to get children to sleep. Also, the head teacher empowers me as a leader in the excursion so I can take other teachers on excursion with children. I will organize everything. We can show leadership in leading excursions actively taking on more responsibilities and supporting Robert by sharing her knowledge of the center and the children to help this new teacher settle in. It's evidenced in Vicky's example that teacher leadership connects to but involves broader responsibilities than teaching. Helping the new teacher settle in is beyond Vicky's teaching responsibilities. However, the knowledge she shared with Robert about the children in the center is based on her teaching experience in the preschool. Penny is from the same center as Wiki. After three months of teaching in the under two room, she had taken the role of the head teacher until the previous head teacher comes back from her maternity leave. When being asked, what are your thoughts on the term leadership and what does leadership look like in your eyes? Annie said, this is the question I'm still learning. Leadership to me is like someone can come and approach you. It's approachable, that knows the positions, that can delegate, ensuring that everything is completed, the tasks are done, and then making sure that the well-being of staff and the children are all okay during those hours, making sure their health are fine and everything is working okay. Coming into the position of head teacher, I saw leadership from a different perspective. The well-being of the staff is really important. Leadership that's showing care and support for other staff because it can be overwhelming. When we ask, in what ways do you see yourself as a leader? Annie responded, I'm still learning leadership because I'm two months into it and I'm learning a lot. It's not easy. I think more for me is like taking a step back and learning to take feedback. Nine times out of 10, my initial thought was, I'm gonna be so angry, I'm gonna talk, I'm not gonna talk to anyone. I feel like I'm doing so much work. The other side of me was when I was talking to the center manager, I need to take a step back, look at how the staff are feeling, how are they responding? Are there concerns I can try to work on myself to make it better for the staff? 
is a hole, a lot of emotions in there. And I need to deflect it, pick up which I can decide first to work on. I got a big circle and I gonna pick two that I can work on each day. So that's one of my goals. In Annie's eyes, leadership involves being approachable, delegating tasks, caring for the well-being of staff and the children, and supporting staff. As a PCT, Annie took up the head teacher role very early in her teaching career, who found that being a leader is not easy. It involves a lot of emotions and can be overwhelming. So she believes that leadership is something that needs ongoing learning and reflection. She is now learning and reflecting on her ways of taking feedback and setting up goals for herself to be a leader. This is my third participating PCT Ruby. You can have a look at her background. In her opinion, leadership in ECE is different from the other industry. It's different from marketing industry. Leadership in ECE is not about holding power on one person's hand. Leadership in ECE is about how to work with others to achieve the common goal, take their respective responsibility for the curriculum planning. She then gave an example I'm prepared for Mataliki immersive event. Each teacher looked after a particular area that related to their intentional teaching and projects. My responsibility was to present children's learnings from all of their mapping experience because I've been working with children about the directions. I think leadership is about teacher in charge, leading the teaching and the curriculum in this process. Leadership means taking the responsibility of your teaching practice, along with working with others, so we all contribute to this project as a team. Ruby's understanding of leadership is consistent with the teacher leadership literature in ACE, that all teachers can enact leadership through working collaboratively and intentionally to achieve common goals. Leadership for Ruby, less more in leading the curriculum. When I asked her in what ways do you see yourself as a leader, Ruby's instant feedback was to deny herself as a leader. She said, well, I don't think I'm a leader, but in the way your colleagues respond to you when you try to propose something, when you come up an idea or a contribution to the curriculum, and how the colleagues support you. For example, we are talking about the water, the guardianship of water. I did a couple of experiments with a small group of children during the meeting time. And then the other teacher was interested in what I was doing. So I shared my planning, observation of the experiments with her. And then we worked together to come up with a better idea to extend that learning. We also implemented the guardianship of the water into a workshop to make a filter. The workshop extended children's learning about how to look after our water, how to look after our environment. Although Ruby quickly rejected calling herself a leader, this interview explicit manifests her leadership in leading the curriculum not simply being a good teacher to follow the center curriculum theme, guardianship of water, Ruby designed related experiments, then shared, discussed, and reshaped experiments with another teacher to create a new learning experience for children. In conclusion, the three examples demonstrate that teacher leadership is not equal to good teaching, but involves all the responsibilities than good teaching, like supporting new teacher to settle in, taking care of the well-being of staff and children, and designing and extending the curriculum. These XPs 
also reflect teacher leadership's complex, contextual, and dynamic features. Three PCTs have different understandings of leadership. As an umbrella term, teacher leadership can include leading curriculum, caring, supporting, empowering, and trusting others, and collaborating equally to achieve a common goal. PCT's diverse understandings of teacher leadership enable them to enact leadership in different ways in their teaching practice to suit their own working environment. For example, the knowledge Vicky shared with the new teacher is specific to her center and the children she works with. The curriculum Ruby and her colleague design is aligned with their center curriculum theme. The second example reflects the dynamic nature of teacher leadership. As Annie put it, she is still learning and working on the Finally, I would also love to hear your thoughts on how teacher leadership differentiates from good teaching. That's all from my presentation. Thank you for listening. And over to you, Louise. Thank you, Alice. Kia ora koutou katoa. Alice's presentation conveyed the importance of PCT's knowledge of the relationship and difference between teaching and leadership to assist them in learning to be aspiring leaders. I will add to her ideas by drawing on some initial findings and examples of ways shadowing methodology can capture teachers' leadership practice to see how they might lead and influence curriculum and pedagogy from their strengths and interests. I will present findings and examples to encourage reflection and discussion about what constitutes good teaching and leadership, utilising shadowing as an effective and sustained research methodology to capture teachers' leadership practice. This presentation is based on my PhD research, where I have completed my data generation phase and have become data analysis. One of my phases entails shadowing methodology, which I will focus on today. The title of my research is Teachers' Influence and Leadership of Curriculum and Pedagogy from Their Strengths and Interests. In ECE, teachers have autonomy in curriculum decision-making and pedagogy. Teachers lead and plan curriculum, including what they choose to follow up on to support children's learning. ECE has a long history of putting children at the center of curriculum, which may leave teachers unsure about their input. Throughout my teaching career and my recent master's research, I continue to be driven by my interest and curiosity to investigate how teachers might lead through bringing their own strengths and interests to the curriculum. Teachers' strengths and interests can include their knowledge and experience in a range of ways. For example, their culture and family, passion and hobbies, subject curriculum areas, other careers and roles, and dispositional attributes. As we know, leadership is important in ECE and that it has the capacity to influence children and teachers. Teacher leadership also has the potential to develop and enhance early childhood teachers' practice, learning, and leadership through experiences. When these experiences are supported by positive opportunities to learn and lead, teachers' confidence and influence on colleagues are enhanced and in turn influence outcomes for children. The following questions guide my research. In what ways might teachers influence and lead curriculum and pedagogy in early childhood settings by drawing on their strengths and interests? How might teaching teens enact leaderful practice 
to influence curriculum and pedagogy from their strengths and interests? And what enablers and constraints might affect teachers' leadership of curriculum and pedagogy from their strengths and interests? My research involves one early learning centre with eight teachers who worked directly with children and one positional leader who does not regularly work directly with children, but supports and influences curriculum and pedagogy. So what is shadowing methodology? Shadowing methodology is known as observation on the move. It is a sustained, intense and layered approach that occurs over time. Shadowing methodology enables data generation of up close and intimate practices. Shadowing involves the researcher following a person closely as they go about their everyday practice and can include video observations and observations as field notes as they engage and interact with others in their environment over time. During the shadowing process, the researcher has opportunities to engage in conversation and reflection with participants, known as contextual interviews. These encourage opportunities of self-observation and self-knowledge. This relationship can be inimitable and complex, as both parties have their own knowledge and understanding of a situation, resulting in a double perception of similarities and differences. Shana Waska refers to this like being a camera with a mirror lens. So why am I using shadowing methodology for my study? My presentation proposes that a shadowing methodology can generate robust, rich and in-depth data, encapsulating nuanced teacher leadership practices that make the implicit practices of leadership explicit by providing insights into otherwise invisible aspects of teachers' leadership work. My shadowing methods include video observations of teachers interacting with children with opportunities for immediate follow-up using contextual interviews, where I ask teachers questions about their in-the-moment thoughts and practices. An area that has proven to be more valuable than I had initially thought are my observation notes about what I noticed alongside the videoing and the contextual interviews including things that I may wish to follow up on, becoming familiar with routines, learning about children's interests, not to mention the interactions I had with the children as situations naturally arose where I shifted into a teacher role. These daily entries went beyond notes as they provided me with a reflective tool to journal my research positioning, and the relationships I was developing with the participants. I also attended team planning meetings, adding another layer of informative data. All of this data then foregrounded the basis of a video stimulated recall interview with each teacher, using a collection of videos for them to reflect on and interpret their practice. These video stimulated recall interviews add another layer, giving a deeper insight into the leadership influences and practices from the participant's viewpoint. Shadowing methodology in my study extends other qualitative fieldwork in that it provides multiple avenues of generating data over time with teacher participants in their setting. And I've lost from it. My study comprised a total of 120 shadowing hours of eight teachers over four months. In addition to these data generation methods, I carried out familiarization visits where I spent time with the teachers and children for over a month. 
a focus group with the teachers at the beginning and end of the study, and individual interviews at the beginning of the shadowing, and an interview with the positional leader of the centre. Given these close and intimate research methods, it was important that I developed trusting and reciprocal relationships with the teachers through well-informed consent and ongoing discussions about my research. By the end of my study, all participants felt the shadowing process enabled them to think about their own practices once they got beyond some nerves with the videoing and also had developed a relationship with me as the researcher. I will now share some initial findings and examples of ways shadowing methodology can capture teachers' leadership practices to see how they might lead and influence curriculum and pedagogy from their strengths and interests based on two teachers' practice in my research. My first example highlights how I generated data about one of the teacher's rows and her worm farm inquiry, and how this data has informed me of her leadership practice and influence on curriculum and pedagogy. During the first focus group, the teachers in each room highlighted that science was currently a whole centre focus and inquiry. A few weeks later, when I was shadowing teachers from another room, I noticed that Rose was exploring some worms with the children. So I began videoing to capture her leading this learning experience. During the video footage, Rose asked the children questions about the worm's colour, length, patterns, and what worms eat. Rose also found a centipede in the dirt, which the children were curious to see how it moved. Rose pointed out about the differences and similarities between the worm and the centipede. Rose said, they both have long bodies, but the worm doesn't have little legs. They were struggling to see the worms, and one of the children said, oh, it might be scared. So Rose said, that is why I'm going to go really gently, as I, I don't want to hurt it. The children also said, maybe it's a baby one or a sister. Rose acknowledged that she wasn't sure, as she didn't know how big worms grow. Once I had finished videoing, I had an opportunity to talk to Rose about her intentions, so we engaged in a contextual interview where I asked her where the idea had come from. Rose said the children had been interested in insects, in particular one of her key children, Joshua. Over the weekend, Rose had found the worms and the centipede in her garden, so she prepared some wormed fact cards with images and information about the different types of worms and their habitats, and she brought along some worms in the dirt for the children to look at. Rose said that bringing in the worms from home and providing fact sheets could be a way to further support the children's interests in insects in the living world. But in addition to this, and important to note for my study, is that Rose also said that she didn't know much about worms and was keen to learn alongside the children. During Rose's individual interview, I used this as another opportunity to ask her about the current science focus and inquiry, where this idea had come from and what had happened so far. Rose shared some informative background details, particularly about how this had been to support child Joshua's interest in worms and his parents success goal for him to be more involved and develop social skills with others. Rose shared. The science came about as I was doing a lot of stuff with living creatures and I wanted to be more intentional with it and to work on other areas of goals for individual children as well but to also just make it a place of wow and joy for that child, that they feel really special when we look at insects. I find children change when you invest in them that way. 
And then on the weekend, I found the worms in my garden. So we were able to carry on that interest. And it was really cool because Joshua didn't know much about worms and I wanted to learn about them too. A few weeks later, Rose brought in a worm farm to set up outside for the teachers and children to use. During another one of our contextual interviews, Rose gave me a rundown on what she had been up to with the worm interest and the new worm farm. Rose said she wanted to continue with a caring for our creatures, kaitiaki focus with Joshua and the other children. She told me they are now focusing on tiger worms, looking at their stripes as that is how they identify them. The worm interest and the worm farm also support Rose's interest. Rose wanted to have a worm farm in the centre almost a year ago as she wanted to introduce composting because of all the food scraps that were going into the rubbish. Just recently, Rose had mentioned to Liz, her positional leader, about Joshua and the worm interest. And Liz supported her and said, well, why don't you just go back to the worm farm idea of yours and just get it? So Rose has gone and bought a worm farm for the centre. And she said, I've been wanting to do this for years. Rose also said that she shared the worm farm with the teachers in the other rooms. She showed them how it works and invited them to use it with the children. Her words were, I don't want it to just be mine. She wanted everyone to be involved. In another contextual interview, Rose informed me how she is interested in learning and inquiring alongside children. Rose had the support and encouragement from her positional leader to buy the worm farm and to pursue following this interest, which was driven by the children's interests, but also her own. The layered approach of my shadowing methodology enabled me to obtain this nuanced, robust, and in-depth data that may have otherwise been missed. Simultaneously, Angie, another teacher in the Kofi room, was leading in curriculum and pedagogy, also exploring the living world with the children. I will now share my second example of how I generated data about Angie and her nature walk and planting seeds focus. Again, the first focus group highlighted how science was a whole centre inquiry and focus. And in her individual interview, Angie shared that a typical weekend at home consisted of her family going on nature and beach walks and that she is fond of the outdoors and being in nature. She also shared how she has started a vegetable garden at home and is enjoying learning more about this. The following week, I obtained video footage where Angie shared some photos from a nature walk that she had been on with her family in the weekend during her group time with the children. She showed photos of the trees, the long wavy grass, a variety of different birds and flowers that she saw on the walk. During this group time, Rose supported Angie by finding a close-up laminated photo of a tui as one of the photos wasn't so clear that Angie had had. Angie was thankful to Rose for supporting her and used the photo to show the children. After the group time, I obtained further footage where Angie used her laptop to look up the sounds that tuis make. In another area of the living world, the following week, I saw Angie had begun planting bean seeds with the children. I also videoed these learning experiences. I had an opportunity to ask Angie more about this in a contextual interview. Angie explained that this idea had come from children's interests in watching the teachers in another yeah. room, in the kōru room, planting some seeds with the children, Interestingly to note is that Angie also said that the planting interest and plan works with Rose's worm farm. She told me, 
then we will have a use for the wormways. I gathered more observations and video footage over these two weeks, where Andrew drew on and extended the focus and inquiry of the living world. For example, Angie chose some books at a group time about owls and kiwis, where she highlighted features of these birds and their habitats. In a contextual interview, I asked Angie about why she followed up in this way, and she said that these were intentional as the children had been interested in birds for some time now, so she was following up. Over the next few weeks, Angie revisited the bean seedlings with watering them and eventually planting them in the garden. Interesting to note was that Angie also supported Rose by checking in on the worms with the children when Rose was away on leave. You can see in Angie's example how the layered approach of my shadowing methodology enabled me to generate data over time with follow-up and through a range of avenues. My shadowing methodology has enabled me to generate nuanced data to reflect examples of good teaching and leadership. One way of looking at these examples of good teaching and leadership are the value-added benefits when teachers influence and lead curriculum and pedagogy from their strengths and interests. Both Rose and Angie's examples highlight the following value-added benefits. Both Rose and Angie showed enjoyment and a preference to follow up and lead curriculum and pedagogy from their strengths and interests. Rose and Angie also showed enthusiasm and in influencing children's engagement by following up and leading these interests and inquiries. Rose and Angie drew on their strengths and interests to extend and spark new interests for children. The examples of Rose and Angie's practice demonstrates teacher leadership that supports positive and authentic learning experiences. In addition to these value-added benefits, Rose and Angie influenced and enabled each other to lead in these areas through support and encouragement. The positional leader, Liz, also supported and enabled Rose and Angie to lead these learning experiences. I now come back to the idea of how a shadowing methodology has enabled a sustained, robust, rich, and in-depth data for my research, making the implicit practice of leadership explicit and providing insights into invisible aspects of leadership. I encourage you to consider aspects of my presentation that may perhaps spark an interest for you and invite any comments or questions. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou. Thank you so much to Alice and Louise for such an interesting presentation. The complexity of knowledge, skills, dispositions, capabilities across good teaching, good leadership, and somewhere in between, if it's some kind of continuum, are really obvious in the presentation. So, uh, yeah, thank you both very much. Both of you suggest that influence is a key defining feature. And Alice, you mentioned that whether a teacher is new or a head teacher or a manager, that they somehow need to be considered as equal. So the first question is for you then. How do you think PCTs might be encouraged to influence more experienced teachers? Thank you so much, Helen, for the question. Mm. That is really an interesting question. And from the data I got right now, um, the, PC, the participating PCTs currently in my research have already influenced the more experienced colleagues they're working with. For example, they may share how some um, functions in the Apple, uh, in the Apple products, to more experienced teachers to improve the ICT that can be used in the ECE settings, and also they, the for the PCTs, they have the up to date knowledge that they just completed 
from their intern, um, from their ITE, and these newly updated knowledge have also been shared with more experienced teachers. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I also I witnessed this influence as my data collection, and I also believe that PCTs can show more can have more influence on other aspects maybe because they have um, marketing backgrounds or they have children specialist backgrounds maybe not ece but their life stories and their um, interests can also influence the more experienced teachers in their everyday teaching practice Thanks, Alice. Those are really great examples. And your last one, of course, connects with um, Louise's work. And I've just got one other question for you, too. Your example of Vicky, um, again, taking on a leadership role when she's still a PCT, it made me wonder how teachers develop confidence in their teacher leadership and whether or not it's by taking on those kinds, or maybe not that kind of responsibility, but is it about responsibilities and being given responsibilities or taking responsibility? So confidence and responsibility, I'm just interested in what you think about that. Oh, just to clarify, sorry, Helen, you mean Vicky or Annie, the one who has the leadership roles? Oh, sorry, was it Annie? Did I write you down the wrong name? My apologies. <laughs> no worries. Yes, Annie took up the leadership role very early in her teaching career. Oh. Her confidence, I think, first of all, during um, during the interview and the conversations between us, I found her confidence, first of all, comes from her personality. She has a very clear goal where she would like to pursue in her teaching career, that she would like to be a head teacher, she would, love, she would want to be a center manager in the future. So she knows very much what she wants to do uh, in the long term. And also her confidence comes from the support from other teachers, either in her team or the head teacher in another room and the center manager's support. Mm. She mentioned to me that she, she knows she always have a place to go when she has any questions and this helped her to build her confidence to take the head teacher role and to continue learning how to be a leader yes that was that was fascinating so thank you that's a really interesting response too and louise you talked about offering some insights into the invisible aspects of teachers teaching practice and teacher leadership in a sense I wondered if you could first comment on why you think these are invisible. Oh, that is a good question, Helen. First, um, that thing that comes to mind for me is that invisible uh, would be some of those things that we take for granted on a daily basis as teachers as we interact and engage with each other. And during the video stimulated recall interviews that I carried out, that um, that was highlighted by the teachers and in the final focus group, they enjoyed it, um, actually celebrating the way that they worked together as a team and how much they, you know, they didn't, they took for granted how much they talk during their practice and share, um, support each other. And they enjoyed seeing that in, in some of the videos that I had um, shared with them. Some of the other things that might be invisible is when you use video footage, you're, yeah, you're, you're capturing um, things that you might not if you were just to do an interview or um, a focus group or discussion. The video was able to highlight and then use those to recall because... There's something powerful about um, being able to see yourself in practice and um, hearing, but also seeing how you move around each other in the body language. Sometimes things weren't said, and sometimes things can't be said in front of children, but that intuition and the colleagues and teamwork working together, being able to see, to see those. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. 
And, mm -hmm. and you've just kind of led into the last question that I'd like to ask you too was, um, you've just highlighted some of the benefits of teachers being able to see themselves on video, but I'm kind of mindful of Alice's comment about Annie saying that um, she thought she might be angry and receiving feedback on, on her own leadership. So I wondered if you could just give one or two pieces of advice for teaching teams considering use of video on each other as part of their evaluations or their professional learning. Yes, so if they were going to use it for video um, coaching, mm. I think what's important is that the person who's receiving the feedback is that they select the moment and the video footage that 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 they capture. So they're taking that ownership. And from my experience, um, during the research, um, I was able to take part in some of the video coaching feedback sessions where they would give their take on the video first and sometimes they would ask what feedback they were looking for there was a particular focus so that way that vulnerability um they were they had control over choosing what it was about mm, great thank you and uh, both of you thank you so much for your contribution today you've given us so much to think about and discuss and to action and Lorna's put a, a comment up too that, you know, wondering if it is possible to separate leadership from good teaching. And I think you've both illustrated that it's not because of the collaborative nature, it's contextual, it's dynamic, and um, all, all of the things that you've discussed with us today. So, yes, um, thank you again both so much. And I'll just hand back to Justine to close the webinar. Helen, and thank you, Alice and Louise, for your presentations today. It's really exciting to be able to hear from those who are actively involved in current research, and your presentations have affirmed the important role that early childhood leaders and teachers play in the early years. And I'm sure that the ideas you've shared today are going to stimulate further discussions for our audience within their own settings and contexts about early childhood teaching practice and leadership. So namahi nui kia korua. We're very appreciative of your time and the sharing of your expertise. We know that you're very busy and engrossed in your research at the moment. Um, if any of you have been inspired by Louise and Alice's presentation and you would like to pursue further study or research yourselves, then the University of Auckland does have a range of postgrad courses in ECE on offer, including one um, on early childhood leadership, which is actually starting this week. So if you're interested, you can contact Anita. Um, and you can email her at pgt at auckland.ac.nz. And there's also information about postgrad study and Anita's email address in the webinar chat if you want to go and find that. But to all of you as our Early Childhood Seminar Series audience, if you want to share or you visit this presentation, please check out our Early Childhood Seminar Series YouTube channel. The recording of the seminar will be available in a couple of days. And we're looking forward to seeing you all back for our next seminar in March with Dr. Liz Chesworth from the University of Sheffield in England. So keep an eye on your inbox for the flyer and for registration information. Thank you again for joining us today. And we'll close with karakia. Kia tau te rangi marie e, o te rangi e tu i honei, o papatuanuku e tākoto nei, o te taiao e afi nei, ki runga e a tātou, Pihei Māori Ora. May the peace of the sky above, of the earth below, of the all-embracing universe rest upon us all. Behold, it is life. Take good care, everyone. Kakiti anō.